Welcome back to How to Fix Democracy, the show that tries to make it easy to understand many of the challenges and opportunities uh, for democracies in the early 21st century. Uh, the third series um, in our show uh, is focusing, as you all know, in, in 2021 uh, on the issue of citizenship. We've tried to make it easy to understand, again, both the challenges and opportunities uh, of citizens and citizenship in terms of strengthening democracy. One company that is in the business of making the business, if you like, of citizenship easier, more accessible, and indeed more fun, uh, is a, a Brussels, a Belgium-based company, a startup called Citizen Lab. Uh, their CEO and founder, uh, Vitsi uh, Van Ransbeek. I hope I've given his name uh, some justice. I apologize, uh, Vitsi, if I've mangled it to some extent. Indeed, uh, the, 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 um, the handle of, of Citizen Lab when you go to their website is community engagement made easy. Uh, Vitsi, what does that mean? community engagement made easy? And, and what does uh, your startup Citizen Lab do to make it easy? Yeah, well, we have, um, or we have developed an online community engagement platform, a digital democracy platform, you could say, which gives citizens the opportunity to have a say on the topics that they care about. Um, so very practically, how does it work? The governments that we work with, they have a platform, a platform, a digital platform, on which on the one hand, they have the projects listed on which they are currently working. Um, so that's kind of, you could say, the, the top-down approach to citizen engagement. Hey, we're working currently on new strategic plan and we'd love to hear your ideas. We have 6 million uh, participatory budgets that we can allocate to community projects, or maybe there's a certain policy issue such as, hey, um, we are going to redesign the, public, the, the market square and here are a couple of designs we want to hear your opinion. So these are really the projects that they're working on and citizens can uh, then uh, yeah, influence these uh, public decisions. That's one way to have a say as a citizen. And then on the other hand, more from the bottom up, as a citizen, you can also come up with your own proposals, gather a minimum number of votes and communicate your proposal to your council um, to have it at least being discussed by a council. So that's uh, the way that it, that it works, a platform, and all this with the bigger mission to make public decision-making more inclusive, more participatory, and um, more responsive as well. And that's something that we're doing today with about over 300 uh, governments worldwide. You're a private company, though, Vitz. So you're, you're in the business of making money yourselves. How can we trust startups like yours to actually make local democracy more participatory, as opposed to, for example, when it comes to Silicon Valley startups, um, corrupting the critical process, uh, destroying privacy, mm -hmm. putting data and other private materials in the hands of governments. Mm -hmm. One important way to create a public trust for us as a, as a we're indeed a company, but we're also a social enterprise having a, we're for profit, but we also have a social purpose. One way to achieve that. What does is, that mean? Um, you have a social purpose. Well, we see our actions based on the impact that we're making, not only by the money that we're making, and that's something really important. Uh, we believe that you can combine both being profitable, generating revenues, but on the other hand, steer your actions based on uh, impact indicators, such as like, uh, yeah, how many decisions are we influencing? How many citizens are we getting engaged? Um, so they don't have to, per se, contradict each other. Um, they can go hand in hand. But next to that, I also want to say that um, as a private company, it's really key working in the space of, of civic technology and digital democracy to be transparent. Uh, in our case, we do that by having all the code uh, being open, having also an open, open source version of our platform and giving really yeah, full transparency on um, on the code and the algorithms that are in the end going to obviously indeed also um, affect the democratic outcomes. So that's something that is really important to have the transparency in place and, and, uh, and yeah, to be open. Why should citizenship be easy? In all seriousness, shouldn't it require some work? 
it's not like uh, clicking on a on a on a, a Facebook like or, or or putting up a tweet. Isn't the problem with digital technology? Is it gives the illusion of easiness and it, and it turns citizens into consumers. Why not make citizenship hard uh, and therefore reward people who really want to make the effort? Well, there should be a good mix of having so-called thin and thick engagement. You could say the difficult and the easy engagement. You can have a uh, very wide engagement and make it accessible and, and easy for people whenever they are affected by a public decision that they can have a, have a direct say on these issues. That's our mission. That's what we hope to do by putting digital technology in place and, and yeah, breaking down the barriers to actually participate. But it doesn't exclude also having some issues uh, which, and I totally agree there with you, uh, which we can have or on which we should have more debate, more in-depth discussion. Um, so I think that the two can go hand in hand. And I agree with you that's one of the challenges for digital democracy to find a good model for really going in depth, having these online conversations, because we've seen that things such as actions such as voting, and you refer to, to Facebook with, with likes, uh, that, that's one thing indeed, but uh, also signing proposals, for instance, these things that can be done at scale successfully. But when we're talking about deliberation, that still remains a challenge. Uh, although I think with COVID now, we've seen that um, with so many Zoom calls, with so many workshops, that have been some really interesting experiments also in doing mass deliberation, the more difficult engagement, if you want. Um, and I think there are some very promising signals there to have more in-depth face-to-face discussions between citizens uh, combined with, as I said, like more of the teen engagement, making it easy for more people to be included and follow um, what's going on in, in the city or, or their, the government. Are you making it, uh, is your goal to make it easy for the local authority to access uh, the desires of, of their citizens? Or is the goal to make it easy for the citizens themselves or both? Well, in, in it, it's for both. If we look at the substitute today, if one of the ways to engage and still the default way is to attend the town hall meeting, to go, uh, especially at a local level, to go on a Tuesday night at eight o'clock, um, to go to a town hall meeting, and then you will only have a very small group of engaged citizens. And that's really difficult if you want to, to go there and to spend so much time there. So indeed, it's- so they, they, in Those people are, 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 are kind of professional citizens, as you say. They're the people who, who show up for every town hall meeting uh, at eight in the week uh, when most people have to feed their families or perhaps even work. Um, so you're, you're taking- you're taking power out of the hands of these very active semi-professional citizens and giving it to everybody. That, that's right. You only see a small group of citizens, often the same profiles, participating in these town hall meetings, whereas our goal is to actually reach a more diverse audience and, and to, be, to make it also more inclusive in that way to, to, get, to have a wider audience participating in these public decisions. Um, but as I said, it doesn't per se exclude to also have some projects on which you have perhaps less participants in a more deliberative way, in a way that requires more upfront reading uh, to be able to participate. Uh, so we believe you can have both. You can have a wide audience to be engaged on, on a wide range of topics, and then to have some in-depth processes with some citizens assemblies, with small groups, uh, where you also have um, that in-depth engagement on more complex issues. Uh, are you suggesting that your platform is, is focused on bringing in uh, people of different ethnicities and genders and religions? Well, yeah, that's definitely um, one, of the, one of our goals is that if you look today at also what, what's happening on social media networks, and I think that's definitely uh, one of the trends that we'll be outsourcing our digital democracies to the social media networks, which are very um, polarized uh, mediums, you could say. Uh, each in our eco bubbles, then it's one of our goals to have an institutional platform because we're working with the government where people with different backgrounds can meet, where they can also disagree so that it's really designed to have the deliberation, to come with pro arguments, to come with con arguments, but in such a way that people can listen to each other. Um, so that's for sure the goal. Um, we're not that we're not directly focused on ethnicity or religion. It's more on the diversity of opinions. 
How'd you um, do that though? I, I, I take your point that social media, the dominant yeah. social media platforms, the Facebooks and Twitters of the world are very divisive. They're echo chambers. Oh. It's very rare for people of different opinions to have anything to do with one another. How do platforms like Citizen Lab actually engage people of different opinions? Well, let me give maybe a concrete example here. In uh, Nuuk, the city of, of Greenland, they had um, a policy question of whether they should remove the statue of a Danish missionary of the 16th century, uh, all in light of, of uh, Black Lives Matter and decolonization of public space, whether they should remove that statue or not. And the way they approach this question is, first of all, listing and crowdsourcing arguments for both keeping it and for removing it. And so that's step one, to actually have that deliberation to think about what are the pros, what are the cons, before actually going to uh, the voting phase. So I think that is one important uh, design in, in, of these platforms, to be focused more on pros and cons and deliberation, weighing of the different perspectives, before actually going to, hey, I want to express my opinion. Because I think one of the risks there is if we only focus on the voting and not so much on, on, on the commenting and the argumentation is that digital participation is going to be a very individual act of, hey, here is my preference uh, and we're not going to be able to listen to each other and to come to collective decisions. So that is uh, just one example of, of how I think with argumentation and deliberation and having these discussions that um, that, that could definitely help to have uh, yeah, more, that more diverse views and to also have a safe and accessible space to uh, express these views. Uh, is, uh, is your platform and platforms like yours, are they digital versions of citizen assemblies? In our uh, movie, How to Fix Democracy, I traveled to Ireland and interviewed a number of people involved in Irish citizen assemblies. They're pioneering these physical spaces where citizens meet to discuss uh, tricky, thorny issues like uh, like abortion. Um, how do you connect as um, as a platform with citizen assemblies? Yeah, well, we also have these two dimensions of we call them now um, synchronous and asynchronous participation. Asynchronous is you could say between brackets the traditional online participation of sharing your ideas, commenting, voting. Uh, whenever you want. Um, that's something that a very wide audience can do whenever they want, wherever they are. But then there's also having these online deliberations, online workshops, and I think that comes closer to, to what you call here citizen assemblies, uh, where we also have yeah, a smaller group of citizens coming together, discussing these issues, so that you have actually both the face-to-face -face conversations and then the online participation. And since COVID, we've been hosting a lot of these online workshops. Um, and yeah, it's something that I think is, is definitely one of the biggest challenges for digital democracy is how can you bring that aspect of deliberation that citizen assemblies do so well having these as, yeah, physical spaces to meet and to listen to each other. How do you recreate that in an online space? That's a challenge, but as said, we are hosting lots of these workshops and learning a lot about how to do that better and uh, something I'm excited about, about how to bring these citizen assemblies to scale using digital technologies. How concerned are you that some of these local digital initiatives will get hijacked by Silicon Valley Leviathans, trillion dollar companies like Amazon or, or Google? We had the Canadian uh, internet activist Bianca Wiley on the show recently. I'm sure you know her, she's Toronto based and she's a very outspoken critic of the Sidewalk Labs initiative begun by Google, which really, I think in her mind and many others, uh, corrupted the idea of local government. Google tried to use it to essentially hijack local issues in Toronto for their own benefits. Mm -hmm. Well, the governments that we work with, they have very high standards when it comes to privacy, when it comes to security. And I think that is really important that it's um, a public initiative. They can, I think they should work with, with or they can work with private initiatives uh, such as ours. It doesn't exclude the fact that we're, that we're private, but through public procurement, you can actually design these solutions as a government and you can have a preference for 
open source solutions as they're pushing a lot in, especially in Europe and the Netherlands, where there's some very strict guidelines on only using open source software, having a high standard on privacy. So I think through public procurement, we can give that a steer and we, we, we should put these conditions in place. Avitsi, we've spent a lot of time in, in this series comparing and contrasting citizen initiatives, political initiatives in Canada and the United States. I know you've been involved in a very interesting project in Vancouver. Uh, tell me a little bit about the initiative you've, um, you've been involved with with the city of Vancouver. Yeah, that's an initiative that, we, that we've done about three years ago, so it's a pretty old one. But what we've done there is, um, or the city of Vancouver, what they did is they had installed uh, an empty uh, housing tax, basically as a reaction to the fact that the, the prices on the real estate market were rising so quickly that it said, all right, we're going to uh, collect here 30 million Canadian dollars through housing tax. And then we're going to reallocate these funds, the $30 million, um, into housing initiatives. We want to hear your ideas about what we should do with the $30 million. Uh, and the main group of ideas that came out from the community was, on the one hand, we should have more um, accommodation for the homeless and for people who cannot afford accommodation. Uh, there was one uh, group of ideas. The other group was... Um, yeah, we think that it should be new ways of, of living together, uh, co-housing, etc. That's something that should be stimulated by the government. Then there was also a third group that said, no, we don't want to pay this tax. And then there was also reasoning behind why do we think that we should not pay this tax. So that was for the city also interesting to know um, yeah, what the main arguments were, also who these people were, um, and that's what came out of this project. Was it a success? Do you consider it one of your models for uh, Citizen Labs? Um, I think it was, a, well, yeah, I think it was, except it was not one of our major projects. We've done some, I think more, maybe more interesting, I mean, more interesting, some other projects that we use more as, as the, the ones that we put forward, um, including, for instance, the city of Ghent in Belgium. Mm. They um, are doing a participatory budget of 6 million euros. That they are that they are allocating, or that the community is allocating to community initiatives uh, in all the different districts of the city. So that's a city of about two hundred fifty thousand uh, inhabitants. That's that's one case. Um, Lead me through no that. Is... It's a it's a fascinating uh, initiative and experiment, Vitsi. Uh, so the city of Ghent has um, six six million euros allocated to local government, uh, and they bring you in as a platform partner. How does that work? Yeah. Do you do you provide citizens with the platform to um, to argue that the money should go here or there to sports stadiums or the environment mm -hmm. or local parks or trash collection? Yeah, exactly. So it's organized per neighborhood, and in the first phase of the project, the community, so the citizens, they can come up with ideas for their neighborhood. They could say, indeed, we need new a new sports stadium we want to a playground here um, or we want to make our neighborhood greener and we want to have to see trees here so that's the first phase of collecting these ideas and then from there they're going into groups of ideas into clusters and seeing the bigger priorities and they're getting into the phase of uh, project development uh, where they have groups of citizens developing these projects together thinking about feasibility thinking about budget uh, how it could be concretized and that's something that's also being done. So again, like talking about thin and thick engagement, the first part is ID, uh, ID collection online. The second part is with in-person meetings. Of course, due to COVID, it was not possible now, but they're going to continue that with phys uh, physical gatherings. And um, then they will go to the ballot box, 6 million euros that they can be divided to uh, all these projects that they have developed. And then they can choose which projects should be financed here uh, for our neighborhood. That's the, how the process works. One of the more convincing critiques of the EU, certainly I think in the UK when it came to the Brexit vote, was that the ideology of the EU is a top-down uh, technocracy. Everything gets quantified, everything gets crunched in numbers and analytics. Now I know that the purpose in a sense of your platform or platforms like you are empowering everyone, uh, open source and all the rest of it. 
But would it be fair to say that platforms like yours are also um, a, a piece of a, a kind of digital technocratic approach to government uh, as opposed to um, as opposed to other ways of thinking about politics and citizenship? Um, why would you say so? Why, why, would, why would that strengthen like a technocratic uh, way of government? Well, you seem to be in the business of, of trying to quantify everything. You aggregate voices, um, you use artificial intelligence to crunch numbers. It, it, it seems to me as if the, the guiding philosophy, the ideology of platforms like yours is technocracy. Perhaps I'm wrong. Well, well at least our mission is to do uh, rather the opposite and to include more, more of the population, the people who are not per se the experts on the topic, but who mm -hmm. have a stake, who are affected by that decision that they can make their voice heard. Um, so, well, yeah, to really open it up beyond the experts, that's our mission. Uh, that's why I was also asking about why would you, why would you say so? On um, making it quantitative, um, the way for us to also measure our impact is not only looking at how many people participated, how many citizens participated, but also look at the quality of the, of the process. How have the public decisions that have been shaped, how have they been uh, affected or influenced by uh, the input of the community. Um, so we do both like looking at the quality and the quantity of the inputs, but it's at least important, not only for ourselves, but for digital democracy to, uh, yeah, indeed not only look at the vanity metrics of so many participants, but look at what's being said and look at uh, the quality of the process as well. And I think by the way, that that is one of the um, threats and dangers of, of digital democracy is that uh, all the governments are getting convinced that we that they have to do online participation, that they have to involve their community in decisions being made. But one of the threats there is that they're going to launch tokenistic projects that are not most meaningful. Hey, what would be, you know, like the name of the of our next swimming pool in the city? Um, so I think that's one of the challenges for the coming years to make to be really critical of that and to make sure that this, uh, yeah, that these projects are high stake, highly political. And that they that they matter to people that are not just about the small things. Uh, let's see your uh, your website and your platform boasts that you use natural language processing mm -hmm. to, to to make uh, your product more intelligent. Um, that's a, of course a euphemism for artificial intelligence for machine learning. Um, should we be concerned with this? How are you integrating AI into your platform and how can we trust that? Yeah, um, so we use um, AI or, or text analytics, especially in, in, um, to, yeah, to analyze all the ideas. So once you've collected hundreds or thousands of ideas for the strategic plan for the future of your city, then for the civil servants, the way that they do that today is they go through a spreadsheet one by one all the 2000 ideas, they group them, and that takes weeks of work to be able to do that. And it's also one of the barriers for them towards more participation is that it takes too much time for us. So what we try to do is um, actually make that whole process a little more efficient. Um, of course, the civil servants, they should, be, they should remain in control, should be able to still analyze it themselves, but at least there is some assistance by that technology, by the smart technology to give some ideas of, hey, that's what's being talked about. And I think what's most important is that the AI is explainable, that it can be, that it's clear how it works and why you get to see a certain outcome. And that it's also uh, transparent, that it's shared with the public, that they can also look at these results and that it's not only something that is uh, accessible to the government. Could you explain in a little bit more detail what that actually means? It seems to me that um, public servants, uh, local bureaucrats, local politicians should be reading what local citizens think and say. They should be hearing or watching or reading. Once it gets broken down by machines, um, then the whole democratic process is profoundly undermined, isn't it? True, but it's, it's here more of an assistance to find, you know, like the groups of ideas, to find the clusters, to find the, 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 the keywords. When you say cluster, what does that mean? Yeah, so let me maybe uh, concretize a little how that works. So 
imagine that we have 1000 ideas collected uh, for for the future of a city uh, different ideas for, for that should come into the strategic plan of the city um, then what we're going to do or what, or what the technology is going to do is going to look semantically at each of these ideas so talking about the vancouver project if i'm talking about empty houses and you're talking about accommodation that is not used then we know that it's about a similar thing and we're putting it together and it comes under the same group of hey this is about empty accommodation so basically that's what the technology is doing mainly clustering these ideas into so, so that's priorities. Well, you call it semantic analysis um yeah uh, exactly. so making generalizations about language is that right exactly that's correct to find actually a bit of a common structure because you have large volumes of of, of, of input here and to make it easy, easier to, to, to grasp what's being said, what's, uh, what the community is uh, talking about. But again, I wouldn't per se exclude, of course, they would go through these ideas, but then at least you find like, hey, what are the, the common denominators here? What are the, the main topics that are being talked about? And that allows, or at least makes it much easier for the city, for the uh, public officials to dive into each of these priorities and see what's being said. Uh, Vitsi, finally, we had the, um, the Canadian dystopian writer Margaret Atwood, the novelist on the show uh, earlier this year. She's, of course, the author of Handmaid's Tale. It was, that was a book about the way in which seemingly decent ideas got corrupted and got transformed into dictatorship and exploitation into a dark, dark future. Are you concerned about potential digital dystopias? You mentioned that earlier. How do we need to guard not against uh, worthy startups like Sidewall, uh, like um, like Citizen Labs, but how can we guard against the digital future of, to use one of your words or a couple of words, radical transparency, where we lose our privacy, and huge trillion, multi-trillion dollar companies know everything about us, or for that matter, governments know everything about us the kinds of governments that Edward Snowden warned us about? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think in the first place, yes, yeah, as, as I said before, uh, government should remain in control and, and they should be in control of the design, so we shouldn't leave it uh, only to the, to the private companies. Um, but I don't think, actually, just want to get back to that, I don't think that transparency and privacy, they don't exclude each other. You can be fully transparent on your code. I just wanted to make it very clear. Uh, the code can be open, but you can still have the very highest standards of, uh, of, or the very highest data standards. And I think the fact that in Europe that we have the GDPR, which is already something of a very pretty high standards, uh, working with governments, it's always being respected. Um, I don't think that these two conflict they can even strengthen each other um but yeah so you, so, to, sorry so I jump in here you you think that the gdpr the eu initiative on protecting people's privacy you think that's been fairly successful absolutely i think it's really it's really important and and concretely in the case of uh, here digital democracy a resident a citizen who says hey i have expressed this opinion but the resident or or, or, the, or the citizen in this case, they remain also the owner of the data, of their own data, of what they have expressed online and they have the right to be forgotten. If they say, hey, I want to take this offline, they are able to do so. Uh, just as one example, if they say, hey, I want to remove my account here, uh, all of that is, is feasible. And I think that is important that citizens remain in control of, of their own opinions, of their own data, so to speak. Um, and the GDPR sets a, a very good standard there. So yeah, I do think it's, it's a really good thing that we have that. Uh, and hopefully other countries such as the United States that will follow as well here and, and, and uh, yeah, have or put the same standards in place. Um, absolutely. Yeah, sorry, I interrupted you. While you. You were talking about the dangers of dystopia, digital dystopia. You're, 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 you're less concerned than I am, is that correct? Um, well, for me, the, dy the dystopia for digital democracy is that we would go to a system of um, trying to replace our or policymakers, the ones who are still accountable for the policies being made, and that we are going to try to install a direct democracy. Um, our mission is, is, or I believe also that the goal should be to make representative democracy more representative, mm. and that we still have these policymakers to set the vision and the strategy for, for the future, and that they are held accountable because 
so I, I do believe in, in the electoral system that we have put in place. And I see participatory democracy as a way to complement that, to reinforce that, getting more people involved and to not have only elections every five, six years, but to be on a more continuous basis involved if you want to be involved. And um, yeah, going back to the dystopia, I think one uh, dystopian scenario for, for, for digital democracy could be that um, we would install apps or technologies that aim to replace the politicians where we're going to vote in referendums with, with uh, yes and no, and uh, that it's a thumbs up game and that it's a popularity contest. Um, so I think one example there is the five uh, star party in, in Italy where they gather online um, proposals on their, on their party's platform and then these most popular proposals are being actually discussed in, 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 in the parliament and are being proposed. Um, so that's what I see as potentially uh, a dystopian use case of, of digital democracy is that it's going to try to install a direct democracy and it's going to be a very individual act of, of uh, public participation. Um, I said, I, I really believe in, in, I mean, I think it's the biggest check, but I believe in, in, in uh, digital democracy where people can listen to each other. I think that's something that we have not figured out yet how to do that online. Uh, social media are a good example of that, but um, uh, we're not there yet to really listen to each other, to have the value and, and, and you know, the strength of, of a conversation to bring that in or to imitate that into an online environment. But I think that's what we should try to, to aim for, um, including more people, but still having these in-depth conversations about, uh, about policy. Well, uh, Vitsi Van uh, uh, Ransbeek, uh, the founder and CEO of Citizen Lab, I think you've done an excellent job uh, simplifying the challenges and opportunities of digital citizenship, both um, as a thinker and as the CEO of your startup. I want to thank you so much. Uh, for people who want to follow up on Citizen Lab, who want to learn more, what would you suggest? Well, I would suggest to, to have a look at our website, citizenlab.co, C-O, and get in touch with us if they want to know more, if they want to check out the code themselves, if they want to, uh, for their local community or association, if they want to uh, make use of the platform, feel free to do so. Uh, feel free to look at the codes and uh, set it up yourself or ask for our help to do so.